All right, everybody. Thanks to those of you who are on Zoom and those of you who are in the room. I just wanted to give a quick introduction to our amazing speaker today. I'm really excited. Um, Dr. Matthew Deemer is Professor of uh, Education in the newly named Marshall Family School of Education here at Michigan and also a Professor in the Department of Psychology, as well as being a faculty associate here at ISR in the Research Center for Group Dynamics. So some of you may um, have run into him before. He also leads the ACME, AC squared ME lab, the Advancing Critical Consciousness Methods and Equity Lab here on campus. And they have a really great website, so you should go check them out. Professor Deemer is a developmental psychologist who examines how young people resist, challenge, and overcome racial, ethnic, socioeconomic, and other constraints in school, college work, and in their civic and political institutional activity. He's particularly interested in how marginalized people develop critical consciousness, which is a careful analysis of societal inequalities and sort of their structural bases, the motivation to produce social change and participation in social or political action. Um, so we're gonna hear a little bit more about some of his recent work that he's pushing forward that examines best practices in conceptualizing and measuring um, not only social class, but validating these ideas of critical consciousness in a scale using methods that lots of us here at ISR are really um, interested in, um, as well as kind of applying these to understanding how intergenerational mobility and success happen um, and play out in the world. Um, in the area of diversity and inclusivity, I just wanted to be really clear, just given that this is one of our inclusive research matters talks starting out the year, uh, professor's research has helped us to better understand threats and supports to female students' math beliefs and achievements, Latinx and Black young adults' civic and political engagement, and action among um, other kinds of marginalized groups, as well as their academic success. I also just want to say he's won a lot of really great accolades, not surprisingly. He's a um, Spencer National Academy of Education postdoc. And he also what won the Ohana Award. I don't know really um, much about it other than it's um, Counselors for Social Justice from the American Counseling Association. So he's been active for quite a while in these kinds of intellectual and social action pursuits. I also took a look at his Twitter account, which is lovely, and he makes good use of um, gifts. So there's a really great one with the Kool-Aid man that I, I greatly enjoyed, uh, brought me right back. We actually are PhDs from the same year, so maybe it's like oh, a cohort thing. Um, but the sabbatical goals I saw were grow a mustache. So I was a little disappointed when you walked in Sorry. clean shaven today, <laughs> ride my bike more, um, and dig into some of the crit quant stuff that I think he's going to talk about today. So I hope that um, we don't interrupt your sabbatical, but but um, add to it. And I'm, we're so grateful to have you. And for those of you who are on Zoom, I'll be monitoring the chat and allowing you to put questions in there, which will hold mainly to the end. Uh, but if you have questions about clarifying any issues that come up, I think Dr. Deemer is very open to those. So thanks so much. Yes, thank you. Thanks for that kind and careful and specific introduction. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, and thanks for the opportunity to be here with all of you. Um, I am going to dig into a little bit of like esoteric quantitative stuff at the end, but I'm going to do it in a very approachable, digestible way. I promise no equations, no Greek, no Latin, some pictures, and we'll kind of walk through what the pictures mean and frame them in a way that if you kind of understand correlation or regression, you'll be able to dig into what I'm talking about. So that's the back half. The front half, I want to talk about some more um, quantitative ideas that are more philosophical and don't require a particular orientation or training or set of uh, uh, notational understandings to get. So I'll try to make this as digestible as I can. Um, so if I don't, please help me get this more approachable, more understandable, ask the things you're wondering about. I'll say that a lot of the ideas I'm talking about uh, come from a paper that we have under review for the Journal of Research on Educational Effectiveness. They have a special issue on anti-racist and critical methodologies. And we have a paper that we were fortunate enough to submit an abstract that was submitted. So a lot of the ideas I'm talking about come from that paper here. And one of my goals in this talk is to kind of anchor it in these five general guiding principles for critical quantitative methodology we described. I'll say a little bit more about what that means and how we think about it in a moment. And of those five, I'll try to spend a little more time on <clears throat> positionality statements as one more actionable tool or strategy we can use in quantitative methods that is less kind of uh, in the sky philosophical questions about ontology and more here's something specific we can do in our research to try to make it more uh, humanizing, more critical, more equitable. Okay. And then at the end, um, I'll get into these mimic models, which I'll admit are kind of technically arcane, but they're kind of simple to implement and understand once we can talk about it with pictures. So I'll use pictures to do that. That's a lot of times how I teach for ICPSR and other spaces the way I like to communicate and teach. All right. So I'm going to dig right into it. Um, before I do, I just want to acknowledge the authorship team on the paper. So 
me. Uh, and then Michael Frisbee, who's now at Georgia State, Manuel Bardelli, who's a postdoc at Brown, Mike Marchand, who's a faculty member at University of Illinois. And also uh, kind of a reading group that Anna Paulson and the School of Education formed a couple of years ago. They kind of just found this uh, reading list that Jay Garvey, a professor, had created and um, used it as a way to have some really thoughtful and, and uh, engaging conversations, particularly during the height of COVID, which I found really stimulating and helpful. Okay. All right. So I want to um, go forward by looking backward first and, and mention a book a lot of you have maybe seen or heard or read before, White Logic, White <coughs> Methods, uh, Racism Methodology by Tukuku Suberi and Bonilla Silva. And a kind of a uh, short overview of something that they document in this book, and it's been replicated and documented in several other sources, was just the really problematic, troubling history of quantitative methodology generally, and I'll say measurement in particular since we're talking about measurement, but it's certainly not uh, sins that only have been committed in the space of measurement. So um, some of the big figures that we've heard about, so for example, Francis Golden, he was one of the key drivers of the uh, statistical quantitative revolution, but he was also a committed eugenicist and developed these methods in order to propagate beliefs about white supremacy and the superiority of the upper classes in England as the superior uh, beings on the planet. Right? So he developed a journal for eugenics and had this really profound, uh, powerful commitment to eugenics as the idea, idea of reasons why he developed quantitative methodology. <laughs> All right, um, so some other sources that have documented that here. And then Galton kind of has an unholy trinity of people who developed quantitative methods initially that we can think about together. Um, next, Galton's work was carried out by Carl Pearson. Maybe you've estimated a Pearson correlation before. And, and Pearson developed this method of developing correlations in order to set about his scientific goal was to prove the superiority of the Aryan race. So that was his agenda. And then Fisher took this up and kind of worked out and developed ANOVA a little bit more formally. Maybe you've done ANOVA before. And again, the similar motivation was in order to use ANOVA to prove the superiority of the white race at the time. So this is 100 years ago, and, and you might think, oh, okay, so that was 100 years ago, and you know that sort of spirit that animated the development and the genesis of quantitative methods was an artifact of its time and hasn't stuck with us. But you know, much of that has stayed with us since then. Sarah and I were talking a minute ago that we're kind of a similar age cohort. So if this wasn't true for you, maybe it won't land, but you might remember in the mid 1990s, we had the, the book Bell Curve by Murray and Herenstein, or Herenstein Murray, I forgot which one. And you know, took as its project using quantitative methodology to prove the intellectual support superiority of the white race and to prove that uh, people who identify as black and other racial identities in the US are uh, less intellectually gifted, less intellectual capacity and took quantitative methods in order to use that. You know, there was some follow-up work that kind of, once you pulled up this tapestry, it all came apart that they had constructed. There's a lot of problematic things they had done that were technically inaccurate or uh, wrong, right? But still that, I, that book got a lot of, um, got a lot of airtime. I remember when I was in college at the time, a lot of protests and counter protests about the book and it really animated the spirit of the times in some ways. Okay. So again, I don't wanna say that also continued in the nineties, I just, was following a Twitter thread recently where somebody came out with an article sort of saying, not sort of saying, saying, we don't need positionality statements in quantitative research because quantitative research is uh, pop, uh, uh, ontologically true. And so we, the researcher subjectivity doesn't matter at all. So this idea is still persisting with us. So part of who we are. So I think understandably people have come to this conclusion that maybe we should just throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? If my goals are to try to do something that's more equity oriented, anti-racist or critical, Maybe that means I should just not do quantitative methodology, right? So it was developed for these really racist, uh, eugenic, white supremacist purposes. Is that approach, is that set of ideas irredeemable, right? We can't use it anymore. Or is there maybe something else we can do? So I just wanted to uh, include a couple of quotes that illustrate this spirit by Samantha Viano and Dominique Baker, you know, understandably kind of questioning, can we use these tools for more equity-oriented purposes if they were developed for white supremacy? I think it's a genuine thing to wonder about and something we should think carefully about and not sort of really land polemically without thinking about the nuance in doing this. The other kind of uh, motivation that I want to try to introduce to rethink and repurpose quantitative methodology comes from this quote uh, from Audre Lorde, which I've heard misinterpreted many times. So I just want to share that misinterpretation with you all too. So she has this famous quote, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And I've heard it used dozens of times as a rationale to say, 
quantitative methodology is the white man's method and it's the master's tool. So therefore, if our goals are feminist or critical or anti-racist, we cannot use the master's tools to advance those goals. Mm -hmm. We have to go qualitative. That's uh, the argument I've seen that quote used for dozens of times, but it's not what the quote was about. And it's just taken on its own new life. So uh, uh, my colleagues here now at Michigan, Kevin Coakley and Gigi Wad, noted that what Lord was doing at the time was chastising white feminists for only thinking about gender without thinking about other social identities that matter. That's what that quote is about, but it's been taken to mean a whole new different thing canonically. So there's another reason that we can think about this quote that's used to say, reject quantitative methods out of hand. Uh, if we think about that with nuance, we realize that's, that's not about either. So the other part of this I want to sort of, uh, uh, that I want to <clears throat> emphasize is we, I also want to think, is it the people doing the methods or the methods themselves, right? So the methods, I think, were developed for a particular purpose, but it's also associated with particular people. And we want to think about those methods, how they've been used in different ways, right? So there's a bell curve people who use it a certain way, but those aren't the only ways these methods can be used. Let's think about them with more nuance. <coughs> how can we repurpose them? There's also arguments from well-known qualitative scholars. If you've gone to the qualitative canon and you've seen the uh, handbook of qualitative research that Lincoln and Guba edited many times, they're arguing for the use of quantitative data um, as well and purposes for there. And finally, there's a recent use case that I think helps illustrate this a little bit more. And I'll briefly try to set the context but not spend too much time on it. Uh, MAS, MAS, Mexican American Studies was a program in Tucson, Arizona that maybe you've heard about. Um, it's been in contention for probably 10 or 15 years now, if not longer. Essentially, MAS was a uh, critical race theory or ethnic studies curriculum designed for Mexican and Mexican American students in Tucson. It centered their identities and their experiences, and it had some community engaged and more activist elements to it. The interesting part about this program is when people looked at the data, administrative data for Tucson, um, was that with some, I don't think it was propensity score matching, but you know, some quasi-experimental methods, they could match students who were in MAS versus not from Tucson. Those students in MAS, even though they were kind of looking worse in terms of behavioral engagement in school, attendance, grades, achievement scores, those students uh, grew faster, did better in the MAS curriculum than those students in the standard curriculum. So if we look at just traditional metrics that a lot of times educational decision makers care about, students in MAS were doing better. But that really wasn't the issue. What was the issue? It was kind of the politicized content of the curriculum, uh, honoring and discussing Mexicanness very explicitly that was taken to mean the uh, anti-American or unpatriotic or something like that. So that was a lot of the, there was a ban on the Mexican American studies in Tucson, that ban was overturned. It went to different levels of Supreme Court. It made the Daily Show. So it was a big thing that unraveled for many times. One thread of this I want to pull out was uh, Dr. Nolan Cabrera, who is a scholar at University of Arizona, kind of took a role where he tried to be a dispassionate friend of the court and did some quantitative analyses and sort of shared some of the findings that I just shared with you that, hey, MAS, we might discuss or debate the merits of it in terms of its political content, but if our goal in schools is to educate children and have them be engaged and achieve in traditional metrics, which I think we can discuss whether that's the only goal of school, but it's a goal of school, it's doing better than the traditional curriculum. So why did we get rid of this program for that reason, right? So we can think of using quantitative methods in the spirit of equity or social justice. <laughs> His work was important, but I also want to mention, I mean, that's also happened because, and, you know, there's political organizers, there were young people in communities mobilizing to um, articulate the value of the program that it had for young people in the communities as well. Okay. Um, but, so all these things aside, one thing I do want to note is there is a burgeoning critical quantitative literature, and, you know, it's titled critical, so I get it, but there's a lot of don't do this in that literature, but not a lot of do do this. So not a lot of enunciation of what we should do instead. There's a lot of enunciation of don't do these things. And I've kind of so far just said, don't do these things, but I haven't really said as much about what we can do. And I think there's also a lot of value in giving people not a very prescriptive checklist they can do, but some ideas about how they can think about doing things in a more equity oriented way. So what I'd like to talk about is critical quantitative methods. And I wanna quickly delineate these things, this approach from Quant and I'll say it, but I get them jumbled in my mind, so you might too. So uh, quant crit or quant CRT is a very formal instantiation of critical race theory and quantitative methods. And the purpose and spirit of quant crit is to say, how do I take up critical race theory with quantitative methods? How do I pursue the five central tenets of CRT and take those up with quantitative methodology? 
I think it's a very valuable thing to do. But I also think there's a uh, room in spirit to say there's other critical theories that exist, like this crit and legal crit and other things that are important to think about that we could also marry or uh, harmonize with quantitative methods in order to think about doing those things in a more equitable way. So crit quant is CQ, is what I'm going to talk about. Quant CRT is maybe what you've heard about before, but just for the purposes of uh, focus, I'm not going to spend as much time talking about it today. And this idea of crit quant has had a little bit of history in the literature from 2007 is some of the earlier um, findings I've seen of it. You could argue W.B. Du Bois was talking about this 100 years ago, depending on how far back you want to go. There's this idea of being a quantitative criticalist that exists in 2007. And the guiding idea, and I'll spend a little more time being specific, but the guiding idea is not necessarily that we're developing new methods. There's not a new regression approach or a new estimator we use in a multi-level model that is critical or that is equity oriented. It's more taking the existing methods we have and rethinking them and repurposing them in new ways with different kinds of goals and aims. And that's really the spirit of what animates this kind of work. That's one theme. The other theme I would think about in crit quant or CQ is really thinking carefully about using quantitative methodology to call attention to or challenge different forms of oppression that might exist in a given country. So let's talk a little bit more about what this means and I'll try to be a little bit more specific. I think I've talked about these ideas, so I'll just have the quotes up if you'd like to see them, um, but I don't want to spend too much time talking about them, apart from one little thing, which is an argument William Juice Wilson made over 35 years ago, and it also has some currency today. And that argument is, there's a way that you can argue with quantitative methods or make a claim with quantitative methods that's heard differently. I can stand here and say that uh, qualitative and quantitative methods are viewed equally the same in the world, and you would know that that's not true. I, I was trained as a qualitative researcher. I do a lot of mixed methods work. I think qualitative inquiry is very valuable, but I think most of the time in policy circles and funding circles, quantitative research is seen as more rigorous. Whether that's true or not, I think it's something we can think about, but that's the perception. So if that's something we can play to a little bit, I think arguments about equity, race, gender, other kinds of intersecting inequalities are heard in a different way if they're couched in quantitative terminology. So from a measurement perspective, you can say, this test is unfair. That sounds different from, hey, look at the theta distribution across these two populations where A parameter, B parameter being estimated, just heard in a different way. And there are lots of people out there who are not really swayed by an equity argument, but maybe swayed by an equity argument also maybe on technical grounds. And so there's different ways you can be heard, have currency and have impact by using these tools. And some people are starting to articulate this a little bit more formally in literature lately. Uh, so Kevin Strunk is a scholar who's trying to organize people around <laughs> critical quantitative methods. And he characterizes uh, crit quant as a leverage point, right? So if you wanna have a little more leverage in your work, there's a way you can think about marrying these two things together. Lolita Tabron is another scholar kind of trying to articulate a critical quantitative perspective. And she's also arguing that statistics is a powerful tool that can be used to resist oppression through community-driven justice-oriented work. Okay, so what I've tried to do so far is talk about this problematic history, our need to think with um, a little bit more nuance in terms of quantitative methodology. And then what I'd like to do for a couple minutes is just talk about five guiding principles. And honestly, I, we intend these principles to be not cast in stone, but cast in Plato or something else that we can remold and reshape over time as we think about them and test them and critique them and make them better. Okay, so take them for what they will. And they come from this special issue paper I was talking about before. The first of these principles is foundation. <clears throat> and the idea is that critical quantitative or CQ scholarship should be grounded both in critical theories and quantitative methodology throughout the research process, right? So it's not that you just, at the end, when you're interpreting your results, all of a sudden think through, oh, what's a critical perspective I can apply to interpret this? But instead, when you're formulating the initial research questions, you're collecting your data, thinking about measurement analytic strategies, you're thinking about critical theories from the start. And those two things are uh, interrelated strands that are intertwined throughout the process. Similarly, similarly uh, a CQ project or CQ scholarship should be aiming both to advance and elevate either critical theory and quantitative methodology at the same time. Now, I'm not saying it has to be a 50-50 thing. A lot of times you might be doing a more uh, substantive question, taking at a, uh, a theory or a perspective or a dilemma within the critical space and using quantitative methods to address that. So maybe your percentage, your internal working percentage is more on the critical side than the quantitative side. Other times, maybe you're thinking about, hey, this quantitative approach we've always done 
always does this. So one idea I have in my mind is there's a uh, analytic approach I like that always has a dichotomous thing. And the reason is because we've always done it that way. But a dichotomous thing doesn't really capture social identities and the things we care about nearly as well as something that's continuous. So maybe we can think about revamp revamping or advancing that quantitative methodology by thinking about critical theory. Okay? So it's a matter of emphasis, but having both of those twin goals. Um, thirdly, the argument I'll make is that even though a lot of people believe quantitative methods have this corner on ontological truth, they don't necessarily have more inherent truth or rigor than qualitative methods, right? So I've seen plenty of sloppy, imprecise, careless quantitative work. And I think we can say that about qualitative work as well, but it doesn't mean that one of those things is necessarily more inherently rigorous or have more of a uh, handle on ontological truth than the other. Along those lines, and we're very explicitly breaking from a positivist or post-positivist view here, um, if that's not made more clear, is an acknowledgement that you know, research is always this subjective and politicized process. There's no such thing as value-free or objective inquiry. Um, I've met a lot of people who say, I collect my data, I run my stuff in Stata, and then I step back and the truth emerges. But you know, you're making decisions about what to do with outliers, who you collect the data from, what measures you click, how do you subdivide, what do you trim? All these things are subjective decisions that ultimately shape the results you get. You know, whether that's doing sensitivity checks or it's just kind of the natural decision making and forking paths you do throughout the research process. That's shaping what you're gonna end up with and who you are is going to shape that. Which leads into this uh, fifth principle of self-reflexivity, which is something that's much more common and grounded in qualitative inquiry. But we, what I'm trying to argue for is we need to have this paid attention to in quantitative inquiry in the same way, right? So one thing that we can think about is this uh, more uh, prescriptive thing is writing a positionality statement. So you might write a statement articulating how your positionalities shape the research. I'm gonna show a little more specificity than that in a minute, but there's this acknowledgement that if research is subjective, then there's some way that the subjectivity of the researcher and their positions is going to shape the way they're approaching the research question as well. Uh, let me, uh, I'm gonna just put a pin in that and come back to five in just a minute. Well, you know what? I'm gonna just go into five right away, excuse me. We just talked about it. So this idea of self-reflexivity I just talked about, and within that I had said that positionality statements are maybe this uh, important way of being specific and clear in how our subjectivities shape research. And you maybe have seen them in qualitative research before, maybe not, but they're much more common in qualitative research in that genre. My own personal take is a lot of times I think these positionality statements are kind of empty and performative and useless if they're not done well. A lot of times positionality statements I see say, these are my identities, this is who I am, here's my stage of training, period. And you know, if you know somebody personally or you Google them, you can kind of discern most of that just from looking at people, who they are and their Google, uh, excuse me, and their academic profiles and things. These like social identity checkboxes, I don't think necessarily tell you a lot about how that person's identities shape the research, right? So instead, I think when these things are useful, is when people uh, do more to um, talk more with more specificity about how who you are and how you've been socialized to be, how that interrelates and shapes your research question. That's much more useful. And I don't think anybody is probably fully conscious of all the ways that who they are shapes the research, but trying to give some effort into articulating that and unearthing that I think helps the work um, have more rigor, have more thoughtfulness about how who you are shapes the research. Okay, so let me um, just share an example and you can disregard this if you think it's not useful, but I'll set it up and then just give you a minute to read it. So I would like to try to do is to give people here a little bit more anchoring and how do you think through doing this? What does it mean? So this is uh, the personality statement I wrote. So I'm doing a bad thing that I show you a block of text and keep talking because everybody's just reading it, but just give me a minute, I'll set it up and then you can read it. I'll give you time, I promise. So um, in this case, this is a, from that special issue paper I mentioned before, where we're arguing for a critical quantitative approach to measurement and trying to articulate some principles to guide that work. The four co-authors I, I showed in the beginning and I all wrote these individual positionality statements. Not to say it was kind of like a hard thing to wrestle through. What do I include? What do I exclude? What's relevant to include? Um, I think I wrote a paragraph, somebody else wrote four. I was like, well, we should probably have these not be the same word length exactly, but if one of us is spending four times as much time as the other, then that's not good either. What do we wanna put in? What do we wanna put out? And the other part of this that I think was important was we wanted to one, 
try to talk about her identities related to the specific thing we were writing about. And the other thing that's important with these is I don't want uh, the, um, the take home from this to be, you have to disclose things you don't want to, right? So you might live in a state that you have a disability you don't want to disclose or a set of uh, people you're attracted to you don't want being made public or other things about yourself you don't want being made widely known. You don't, not force disclosure and there are things you don't want to share, right? So these are not intended to be, um, you're given some kind of truth to the serum and you have to say everything about yourself, right? It's about to be thoughtful about how am I disclosing identities and making them useful. All right, so I've talked for a long time. I'll just give a minute for you all to read this, just so you have an idea what this could look like. And then from pieces of this you think are helpful, feel free to take them up. Pieces of this you think are not useful, don't use them. So I'll just give you a minute to read them. But if, I'm sorry, if, mm -hmm. if this would help, if, if you're saying that this gives me an, an, an insight into the bias that is embedded in your mm -hmm. research, mm -hmm. And if you then can cherry pick, if you, for instance, don't want to disclose something, yeah. I mean, how do you know that that was not the one that actually biased you? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, that, yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, there's a lot of things in here, and uh -huh. you're basically saying I don't know how they connect to my <coughs> my the bias that I used in multi-level modeling. But mm -hmm. here it is, you figure it out. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to actually disclose X and Y. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think you're just going halfway. I mean, either you say you have to reveal in order to give somebody a chance, or, or I, I think this is halfway. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I guess I put my percentages higher than half, but I think that's a fair point, right? And the reason I say that is, there's a long history of people saying they're mindful of their biases and they're terrible at it. And I'm probably bad at it too. So all of us are, you know, not perfectly aware of all the biases we have and they're called implicit or hidden biases for a reason. They're often hidden from us for different reasons. Um, I think something is better than nothing. So some of it is just trying to do some articulation and accounting for who you are and how it shapes the work you do. And then I think sometimes there's, I didn't say this as much about now, but when we wrote this individual one, we also had this collective statement about, all right, in this team, what are some other things that maybe we're missing or not saying? Uh, we were a cross-racial team. What are some of the ways whiteness shaped what we said that did or didn't? Um, but I don't think that doing this is, um, I didn't intend to say that this is gonna surface everything that might be at play, but it's an attempt in the way direction. So yeah, maybe I wanna go more than half, half measure, but yeah, but it's not 100% either, somewhere in between. But I, I think that's very fair. You, um, you're not always going to be able to surface all the implicit hidden biases you have, but some attempt toward it, I think, is better than that. Thanks. Um, other questions on this, just since we're in the space? Yeah, in the back, Mike. Could there be uh, an additional sentence after this general statement that's uh -huh. on the order of uh, in the current study? Yeah. For the key concepts of X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. this could be relevant because. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There could be. In this case, it was more of a conceptual piece where we had a tiny empirical part, so that wasn't really as operative here. But I think in a in a in your typical empirical study, something saying something about how that I think would be useful. Then maybe go to this prior question. Yeah, yeah, that's helpful. I think that's would be good for me to flesh out a little bit more in this example. Thanks. Um, you have a question? Yeah, I, it's really helpful to think about like how this would fit into a typical quantitative paper. Mm -hmm. um, I have two two questions which hopefully are both brief. One is, are you envisioning that this would be like part of the author statement or that it would be a method section or maybe it doesn't matter, but. Yeah, I think, um, oh, go ahead. And then my second is, um, to me, it seems like part of um, the need for reflexivity is also, you're probably, do do this in your work, but like about the data and the measures, of, mm -hmm. you know, kind of taking this critical approach, mm -hmm. not only about yourself, but also the tools that you, at yeah. your disposal. So mm -hmm. kind of how do you sort of thread that throughout the, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, I mean, there's not a lot of, there's not like a canonical way people do this in quantitative papers. So we did struggle a little bit about like what to include and where to put it. But I think we had this before kind of the method section of our paper because then we started to get into an empirical example to talk about these ideas we talked about. The other kind of issue we had is um, like just how much to get into this because it's yeah. we didn't want it to be just this navel gazing exercise of well, here's all this introspection. Most people don't care so much for that, and I don't know if it's necessarily useful to use up all your page space on that. So we did struggle a little bit of like how much to weave this in in other parts of the paper, right? Because we want it to be about the ideas in the paper, not so much about us, but 
who we are is also shaping ideas in the paper. So I think there's a foregrounding, backgrounding with this that I think people are going to keep looking through a little bit. Thanks. Um, other questions on this self-reflexivity statement, ideas, how to make it better? Okay, I'm going to intentionally, um, I have slides on the other principles, but I'm just going to skim through those because uh, I just want to talk a little bit about a specific example. So I'm going to uh, transition to that now, and then we'll have some more time in about 10 minutes for some broader conversation. But thank you for these ideas about uh, positionality statements. So just looking backward, I just want to summarize that we have this well-established history of this eugenicist and white supremacist uh, foundation of statistics and quantitative methods. But I think there's not necessarily an argument that we have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We can think about how do we reclaim this and think about who are the people doing it? How are they approaching those things? And there's been different strands that kind of frame this thinking about quantitative, critical quantitative methods, such as quantitative criticalism, social justice oriented methodology. There's been a couple of things called critical quantitative. And then also quantitative CRT, quant crit has also been some thinking that shapes the ideas I've tried to talk about with you. I also want to say that um, you're kind, we're, I'm kind of arguing for a unicorn in some ways, right? So somebody who knows critical theory really well and quantitative methodology really well, it's a pretty rare person. Um, and so maybe you want to be part of teams that you're more quantitative and the other people are more critical or vice versa and that you're building capacity that way, but that no one person is expected to be deeply versed in A, they're really heterogeneous landscape of critical theory or be the really heterogeneous landscape of quantitative methodology. No person's supposed to know, can know all those things. There might be you know, ways that if you're more of a quant, critical theories can help you rethink how you're doing your methods, what are the affordances, how am I thinking about them? If you're more critical, then maybe you can think about how can I leverage it, uh, take advantage of what quantitative methodology offers. Because my sort of stance is probably nobody is a perfect 50-50 in both of those things. You probably lean one way or the other a little bit more. All right, so I wanna now spend about 10 minutes just talking through a particular measurement strategy. Uh, promise pictures will make it pretty approachable, I hope. And what I wanna talk about is one thing that I think is not a panacea, but a helpful approach that's relatively simple in my mind that gives us some purchase in the understanding racism measurement, how we can take it up and identify it. Um, that approach is called a mimic model, so it's a Poor name, um, probably not the only thing in quantitative methodology with a poor name, but I didn't come up with it, but we're stuck with it. And MIMIC stands for multiple indicator and multiple causes model. Um, it's in, these MIMIC models come from the broader late variable modeling tradition. So exploratory fact analysis, confirmatory fact analysis, item response theory, or SCM, where you're regressing latent variables onto each other is kind of the conceptual umbrella that we're going for. And if you're not super familiar with that, I'll give a picture in a minute that hopefully will make it a little bit more clear. When we're trying to think about racism and measurement, um, we're animated or I'm animated by this idea from uh, our new colleague here at Michigan, Jennifer Randall, who argues, will specific identity groups be particularly disadvantaged by the ways in which the construct is being defined, right? So really thinking from the outset about how equity or racism might be animating the way we're conceptualizing what we're trying to measure, as well as going out trying to measure it from the get-go. All right, so let me give a picture. Um, if you're really familiar with factor models, I'm sorry, you'll be bored for a minute. If you're unfamiliar, I'll try to make this approachable. So when we're trying to do measurement, we always have this latent variable that we're trying to measure. If you're doing observed regressions, you don't really uh, try to think about how well did my items measure my latent construct, but if you're using the Beck depression inventory, you have this mental model in your head that there's a latent construct of depression that you're trying to measure. And you're not necessarily going to the trouble of measuring it as a late variable, but you're using depression inventory because you're trying to measure depression. Kind of makes sense, but I think we don't always think about how regression and other approaches map onto this late variable approach. What's different with the late variable approach is you're very intentional about thinking about how do my items measure this late variable that I care about. In this example, I'll give you a little bit more of the substantive grounding here. But this is what we're trying to do in the, in the measurement space, that we think of a late variable in this case we're working from the multi-dimensional inventory of black identity, which is a measure developed by colleagues here at Michigan in the late 90s um, from the multi-dimensional model of racial identity. And the argument is that people who identify as black have different aspects of their identity that are salient. One of those aspects here is racial identity centrality, which is how important or central is my race to my sense of who I am overall. Now, I only have three items up here, but there are many more items in the subscale. The idea is that we can think of racial identity centrality and we can write items that measure that thing. Again, this is pretty foundational measurement stuff, but we don't always think about it so formally, I think. 
the thing I want to point out is we have the arrows going this way, which is 99 point something percent of the time how we go about things in late curve modeling. The idea is whatever my late thing is, is causing scores out here. So I'm saying air quotes causing, but I'm not going to do causing air quotes every time. So I'm not trying to make a causal inference, but this is kind of the mental model we have. The idea is if I have higher unobserved or late levels of centrality, right? So you can't crack open someone's skull and find their racial identity centrality gland and weigh it and know how much centrality they have. It's this unobserved late thing we're trying to get at. The more of that I have at the late level, the more likely to have a higher score on these items that measure centrality. It's kind of the basic premise of measurement. Right? So there's a late variable. The observed indicators are a way of measure that. Um, I didn't think to include them here, but we then have factor loadings that are a way to measure and quantify how well does my latent variable cause, air quotes cause, scores on my items. Okay. And so when we're doing CFA or confirmatory factor analysis or EFA, exploratory factor analysis or other things, this is kind of the way that we quantify and do this. And we have this directionality assumption that the latent thing causes the scores. And that's usually the way we work. So this is a CFA. It really doesn't take that much training to get here. And then from there, we can go to a mimic. So if you could just chop this part off for a second, we can walk through this as a measurement strategy first, and then I can try to make the parts of this that make it a mimic model a little bit more explicit. So we have a latent variable here that's called racialized differential treatment. And what we did is we took data from the Maryland Adolescent Development Context Study that Jackie Eccles, when she was here, collected and stored at ISR in the 90s and 2000s. And this was a unique study of kids and families in Prince George County, Maryland, which was a unique county because the white and black families in that county had pretty comparable levels of socioeconomic status. So it made it unique at the time and currently in terms of not confounding race with class. Okay. So in this case, we've got 618 young people identified as black, 331 young people identified as white. And what we have is a latent variable called racialized social treatment. And the items here, which maybe are a little small, if they are, I apologize, I'll read them, um, are the observed indicators, the boxes here that you see that say B46330 and so on. Those are these items. So the items, I'll read them quickly. Teachers calling you less because of your race. Teachers grade you harder because of your race. You get disciplined more harshly because of your race. Teachers think you're less smart because of your race. And teachers discourage you from taking classes because of your race. So those are these five items here. These estimates represent the factor loadings, standardized. So how much variance in the item is explained by the latent variable here. And you know, you'd interpret those as you would in a typical regression. They range from negative one to one. A higher value means better measurement, all other things being equal. So that's kind of the that's the measurement part of this in a CFA. Um, here's a fit in disease if you care about these things. And the part of it that makes it a mimic is two things. One, you specify a exogenous covariate. So it means on the outside. And in mimic models, the tradition is to make this dichotomous, I think, uh, to be esoteric. It's to make it comparable to detecting diff and item response theory tradition, but I'm, I've never seen anybody say that for sure. But anyway, what you do here is you compare, um, in this case, people identify as white, people identify as black. They serve as the exogenous covariate. In this case, the black students are the reference group, they're the one group. So we were very intentional about that from a quick quant perspective of not always having the white group be the reference group that everybody's compared to, but instead we're gonna make the black students the reference group here. This first path is a way to test, is there a latent mean difference in this construct? And not surprisingly, yes, black students experienced and reported higher levels of racialized differential treatment than white students. So that's not really that surprising probably. And you could do something similar where you could compare an observed mean and just compare the means with a t-test and see do black and white students do this. We have a little bit more precision here because of parsing out measurement error and things like that. Then we can test for diff, are any items biased? And that's the path from, in this case, black to V46330 and V46331. Those are paths to say, are these items biased? After we equate the means of people who identify as black and white to be equal, so we also test for this, but we also control out late mean differences by keeping this path on, then we can test whether these items are biased. So even after equating for different latent levels of differential treatment between black students and white students, we still see bias in how these items are measuring it, such that black students are still more likely to endorse this item even after equating for this. Okay. So here we don't have <clears throat> differential item functioning or diff that we see as problematic in the same way that we might that an SAT item is necessarily privileging something. 
but it's an example how we can think about uh, racism and measurement. How do we identify it? And how can we see it there? Um, I'm gonna quickly click to this one because this, this illustrates, no, I'm not gonna go back. Uh, you have a question, go for yeah. it. Yeah, just I'm a total outsider to these sort of methods. Uh -huh. that, so that point zero nine, that's significant means that if you're controlling for racialized differential treatment, you're still seeing a black white gap in mm -hmm. that variable. Yeah. Would you then like see a negative coefficient for some of the other variables? If, I mean, I'm assuming you're reading everything out that mm -hmm. the sum of the coefficients between black and white question should probably be about zero. Oh, um, I, I have, you know, that's a good question. I don't, I haven't sat down to map it out. I don't think it has to equal out to zero. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to sit down with a code file after this and check, because I'm not sure if that's a good question. Or at least yeah. some would be negative. Yeah, some might be negative, but the rest are kind of trivial or non-significant. Like this one was kind of trending that way. So I listed it. This one was significant. So I listed it. Um, it would take me 10 awkward minutes to find them, but I do have those other coefficients, but it's a good question. I'm going to check that. Thank you. Uh, question in the back. Yeah, so uh, this is really interesting, but I, I've done mimic models in the past. You might have like these five questions about race. You might have the exact same five questions about gender mm -hmm. or something else, some other category. And then you could utilize the fact that you asked the same question. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how I have seen them done before. So that, cause right here, you can't, you can't have coefficients going to every, from black to every single one of these variables, you've overfit the data. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just wondering if that, if that's a way that you can get around some of those things or if they do that, cause I, I yeah, you can't test every, the bias of all of them simultaneously. Yeah. So, oh, I'm sorry. Were you finished? No, no. That's yeah. So what I, what I thought you were going to say, so if I'm answering a different question from what you asked, is that could you instead have like gender as a covariate and then test for the same bias in gender? You could, yeah, you could have like, if you just replace black here with male, you could see <coughs> if questions are about gender, are you seeing the same pattern of difference across gender? Right, I mean, mm -hmm. I guess, yeah, yeah. That's, so you can do that. You could do that. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, so when I have done many models in the past, mm -hmm. it's literally they say, okay, here are five questions. We're going to ask it about race. We're going to ask it about gender. We're mm -hmm. going to ask it about some other category. Mm -hmm. That way, you can utilize the fact that people are reporting on slightly different things, mm -hmm. but in the same, you know, it's that's that different causes, yeah, different indicator mm -hmm. component. Mm -hmm. Whereas this is all about race. Yeah, and that's what I was wondering if, if that's that, that's where this goes, or if this is it. This is yeah. Right. So I, I kind of simplified this example for okay. these purposes, but yeah, you could. You know, have, if you have other measures, so we have the same data set, we're also looking at race, a different thing. Are we seeing bias here in terms of curriculum perceptions or along racial lines? You could also do this with gender if you have questions about gender. Um, this gets in a little bit of the weeds of how you do this. You can look at the software and look at Lagrange multipliers and see where you should be testing these because there is this kind of limit of if you test for everything, then you're overfitting and the model sort of breaks, so to speak. So you have to either my guidance is like use theory to suggest items to test for diff on, or you can look at the output in the range modifiers and then see where to go from there. Um, I think probably let's just pivot towards questions. So I'm gonna stop here in terms of showing you stuff and we'll just have a little more conversation because I appreciate that. Um, I think you had your hand up a minute ago. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm just, I'm trying to understand like with this critical perspective, how we might understand that significant diff result for V46 for the first variable, like mm -hmm. how would you put it into words that sort of controlling for the racial differences overall in the differential treatment? Like, yeah. you still get the same because it's not, as you said, it's not something that we would be concerned about necessarily. Mm -hmm. But, like, what would it tell you? Yeah, so I, I should have said this, and my apologies if I didn't say this. Is so my interpretation of this path from mm -hmm. black to this one yeah. is even after we adjust for black and white students, different levels of this. Black students are still endorsing this item. So to me, the interpretation is this item isn't still capturing something about racism in classrooms. That's because outside. That's so it's sort of more racially. The teacher's calling it the US because of your race is like more racially rooted and better questions. Yeah. Yep. And so this item is like it has a bias in how it measures it because it's not fully capturing how black students endorse it. So even after adjusting for late mean levels, this item is still missing the boat. Right. So even in this case where we're like trying to be really intentional about centering race and measuring racism directly and conceptually and how we're interpreting it, the item still isn't like pulling its weight, so to speak, right? So this coefficient is roughly like, you know, to coincide, never do small, medium, large, but everybody does anyway, like almost a small effect size of small 0.10, 0.10, 0.10, 0.10, 0.10, 0.10, 0.10, 0.10, 0.10, 0.10, 0.10, 0.10, 0.10, 0.
of a standard regression coefficient, even after we adjust for the means, this item is still missing the boat in, how, in terms of how black students are interpreting and experiencing racism in classrooms. Um, I lost track of who asked in what order, so I'm sorry. Maybe we can just go from the back forward. Yeah, please. Um, yeah, I guess I'm, still, I'm sort of picking up on that same thing. Is it, are you, would you interpret it as the, the item like teachers calling you less is the one that's biased or like this, uh, the, the latent variable that you're try, like, trying mm -hmm. to create, so, like that is still not capable of capturing this extra way in which the race is shaping experience? Like, is that the sort of interpretation yeah. or more than this, like you just draw out the survey? My interpretation is more about the item um, because I feel pretty good. And so I'm stepping out of branch and office going to break. I feel pretty good about how this is measuring things to be based on these coefficients. And I would kind of be pretty intentional about this is measuring racism and time we're conceptualizing and measuring it. And then we're then also equalizing the latent mean levels here. So even after that, this isn't working. So that's where I sort of feel like things, things are breaking. The other items we don't have, I mean, we've got some trivial uh, regression paths from these to these. I didn't show them at all because it's a mess, but those are sort of relatively trivial amounts of variance. But this one, we've got the significant amount unexplained even after we equate the latent means. It would also be possible somebody could do a really poor job of measuring this thing. And yeah, the item's not capturing it. But I think, you know, these items to me seem like they're a pretty good way of measuring. Uh, differential treatment in classrooms. These I've been used before. I feel pretty good about this set. So I didn't say that all for, for purposes here, but yeah, you could have a junk measurement and then how do you know the other items are good? Thanks for that question. Um, yeah, we'll keep moving forward. Yeah, so two questions. One on this again, with like a sort of goal of trying to like reduce these kind of like for biases these models that people like treat the weights that you're getting on these variables so that when you're measuring which like differential treatments, there are no more significant backdoor paths from mm -hmm. black to these items. Um, and the second question, I'm, I'm, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on kind of comparing, I'm, I'm totally behind the, you know, accounting for positionality and mm -hmm. thinking about how we do research. Yep. Um, but I think a sort of next step to me that would be like more convincing would be to say, oh, because I have this positionality and like, you know, I'm liberal and I've made all these anti-racist things that like, you know, I'm doing methods in this way. But there are going to people be people who are don't share my opinions and beliefs that they might do the methods this way and like see what we find and try to like mm -hmm. say if we're trying to get at like some sort of ground truth, then like maybe take all these different perspectives and see how our perspectives affect the answers we're getting from the data. Yeah, the second question kind of sounds like it's a replication argument in some sort ways. Or just like, like across you, like, different perspectives, like, like, people from like rookie search <laughs> and they're both trying yeah. to answer the same question mm -hmm. and like. What would they do? Whatever. Yeah, I, I think that could be, you know, one way to think about it in terms of political perspectives and commitments you bring to the work, and are people replicating it? Yeah, and I think transparency about all your code and everything would be a way to sort of have that be open, and people could see that and interrogate that. Um, on the first one, yeah, I don't know if we necessarily use weights. I think I'm getting what you're saying about backdoor pass. I would almost, in this case, think. <clears throat> Maybe we just didn't use this first item, this 46330, right? It's kind of missing something that seems non trivial and important. So perhaps even in a study that's trying to like ground the experience of anti blackness in schools, they would take this item out because it's not fully doing the job as much as the other ones are. Which I don't know, to me, it's when I read these five, it's not that one jumps out at me as the item that's going to be biased. Like there's that a uh, canonical SAT item asked about a regatta that you're like, oh yeah, of course it's gonna privilege rich and more white people than everybody else. Like, it's not a smoking gun biased item in this case to me. Thanks, we'll keep moving forward in the room. Yeah, if I were to put on my, my, my critic hat, critical social theory hat, uh -huh. um, I mean, probably the first thing that I would <coughs> argue is how problematic it is to assume that you can measure two different ethnic or racial groups using the same instrument or that the same instrument has to be free from bias because how can that be from an, even an ethnographic perspective? You know, the, the, just purely the assumption that there's an instrument that is unbiased is already from a critical perspective, highly problematic. I think the second one is to reduce whatever you want to measure uh, to like, a set of items such as these uh, would be, I think, I think another highly problematic uh, approach. 
Now, from a from a I think from a maybe from a more theory perspective, um, have you to what extent do you have to suppress any 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 idea about maybe attribution bias? Because there's sort of the assumption that if I feel discriminated, then I am discriminated. I'm not now talking about, uh, for instance, African Americans, but uh, for instance, I'm an immigrant and I just didn't get a raise, and so I probably didn't get the raise because I'm an immigrant. I mean, that may may indeed be true, but how do we know? You know, so I'm not right now talking about African Americans. I'm just talking more about what you are attributing to those responses. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to be a little linear right now in your in your argumentation. So I very much empathize with 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 the aims of it, but it's it seems like it's almost too easy. And where's the critical part about that? Yeah, I mean I would say it is almost too easy because when we do these models, we're always oversimplifying. Right. So we're making these models of the complex oh, that's world. That's an easy answer for you. You're much cleverer than that. <laughs> <laughs> Let me finish. That's layer one. I mean, layer one is we're always oversimplifying. So yeah, it's going to oversimplify this complex thing. Um, two, I you know I think if you just sort of say it's uh, impossible to come up with a completely unbiased measure, I agree, and it's not that it's perfect, but in some cases maybe we have bias and items that we hadn't anticipated, and we want to try to find that, search that out to improve them. Um, with the goal of making them better, but I, I didn't try to claim it's perfect either, and I don't think that's kind of the goal is to say it's perfect, but as much as how can we think about how racism is permeating what we're trying to do and identify it and take it out. Um, as far as attributions, yeah, this is probably, it's tough because we probably might have had some white respondents who feel like they were discriminated against because of their race, and perceptually, that's how the items are keyed. Right, so ideas about reverse racism and stuff, I think were a little more common in the 90s and 2000s, but I think sometimes people still endorse that. There's capacity to me that would be incorrect, my view, but that's how people are responding to it. So we're kind of using the quantification of that to capture that. Maybe that's being baked into the measure a little bit too, if we flip the perspective. Thank you. Yeah, I think we questions <clears throat> we had about 70 people but your talk was so good that we didn't have very many questions from the zoo so oh, okay. <laughs> but somebody did mention it would be really great um to see an example of the collective reflexivity statement and i'm assuming that was in the special issue that you yeah. mentioned in the early part of the talk so i can um yeah that would be where to find it, a particular example yes hi i ask you uh, two very different kinds of questions first one a really pragmatic uh, so the journal gave space uh, for your reflexivity uh, statement, or we just um, did it. We'll see what they say. <laughs> uh, yeah. that, uh, I'm just curious about what the journal journal's responses may be to yeah. submitting these uh, statements. And then I had a question. Uh, I guess it's of interpretation. Uh, so I'll make it a two parter. Try to uh, try mm -hmm. to be straightforward about it, which is not usually a strength of one. But um, <laughs> so. Um, when you say the measure is biased, uh, biased as a measure of what? So what would be the true parameter that we're looking at or the, the true definition of what you wanted that thing to measure uh, that it's biased as opposed to? Yeah. Because I'm, I'm, str I'm struggling to see the significance of a coefficient controlling for uh, a latent concept racialized differential treatment mm -hmm. as any kind of bias. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe what it's telling you is that uh, that a, a respondent who says teachers are calling on me less because of my race uh, is is that just doesn't go very much into their sense of racial differential treatment. Whereas these other questions, it seems to me, are a higher grade uh, level of yeah. uh, d disconcerting treatment. So mm -hmm. um, or differential treatment rather, well, also disconcerting. Um, so uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, so I guess I I want to hear. Sure. Uh, I get what you elaborate mean. on what it's biased mm -hmm. of. Yep. Do you want me to answer that one first, then we'll go into part B? Sure. Okay. Um, so I, I glossed over this, but the, the part of the model that's testing there is uh, in the measurement invariance parlance, scalar invariance. So your testing is scaling the items the same across your two groups after equating the means to be the same. So this is the intercept, um, or if the items are categorical, it's a threshold. So what that means is if a... Uh, uh, a five should be a five across both groups. A one should be one across groups. In this case, it seems like there's some systematic uh, 
non-invariance or heterogeneity. It's not my language, so it's confusing, but you know, there's bias in terms of uh, people who, who are black who have higher levels of racialized differential treatment, maybe right at four, people who are white who have higher levels of racialized differential treatment, maybe right at five. I'm, I'm using that as a hypothetical example. Technically, it's probably something not quite so obvious, but there's a way that the scaling of the items is different across those two groups, such that the correspondence between the latent level of differential treatment they have isn't reflected in how they endorse the item. Uh, yeah. So, so, and and wouldn't uh, wouldn't one interpretation of that be that uh, uh, a non-black respondent or a white respondent uh, thinks not being called on because of their race is a bigger part of their differential treatment, and a black person thinks it's less. And I don't. Again, I'm thinking mm -hmm. the measure seems to me perfectly reasonable. It's measuring something real. Yeah, uh, and that would turn the interpretation of a different way. That it's yeah. uh, it's how much these things matter to the respondent that's being uh, uh, yeah. teased out. To me, I mean, so it might be uh, to me after equating the latent means, then technically from a measurement perspective, they should endorse the same thing. Like, so I, I I totally get with you. If we could wipe away this path here of this point eleven, then yeah, we would expect these paths to differ across the groups for the reasons that you've said. But if we approximate or uh, constrain the latent means to be similar, then they should be endorsing similar things. So I get what you're saying, but kind of keeping this in and adding this path in means that the group should have the same response to this. Okay. If you don't buy it, that's fine. That's kind of like the measurement perspective and the measurement argument, but yeah. Did you have a part B or? No, but uh, I'll just have to take that. Okay, Beth? Hey, um... Thanks for the presentation. I, I, have, I have a bunch of thoughts. Let me, let me put out this for discussion. I, the, the, there are two points where I, I wonder if this movement um, serves uh, the minority group we have on the, on the, on the board here. Um, one thing is in um, the, um, the claim that um, the history of um, quantitative methodology is racist. Um, uh, I certainly there's a very pronounced strain of development if we look back to the uh, 19th century and the early 20th century. The very pronounced strain of people who made important contributions that everyone in the broad field of methods recognizes who have views that the simple way to put them now would be their racist views. Mm -hmm. um, but that wasn't everybody. Yeah. Um, there was a lot more to it than that. Um, and I wonder a little bit about the effects, you know, somebody who's involved in trying to recruit people to the stats graduate program. I wonder about the effect of, you know, labeling things that way on young uh, African-American or other minority people who are thinking about making that step. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one consideration among others. I'm not, I'm not trying to say it's any more than that, mm -hmm. but it seems to me it's, it's sort of a complex history. Um, for various reasons, it seems like it's become fashionable to boil it down and and, and, and put a simple label on it. And I wonder what that label is serving. Mm -hmm. Relatedly, I also wonder, just hypothetically, since we're talking about education, suppose that we succeed in persuading journal editors to put the positionality statements in papers in appearing in uh, JRE, Journal of Research and Educational Effectiveness. Let's think about how that boils down to African-American kids in Florida or Texas. Unfortunately, I think that means that there's going to we'd be creating an additional barrier in those states, given the political realities there, mm -hmm. to having um, you know beneficial things that are coming up in that literature make their way into into classrooms and practices in those states. Mm -hmm. That's my guess as to how this would play out. Um, yeah, why don't I stop there? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'll I try to write them down, so I'll try to go in reverse order. But yeah, I think there's probably. Um, in a talk, I simplify, there's probably times where you wouldn't want to share a positionality statement, right? And so perhaps if you're talking to a legislative body that's diverse in terms of their political commitments, maybe the positionality statement is not where that would land, for sure. Um, whether people in Florida are reading Dree really carefully, I don't know. But you know, I think there is something to be said about with whom and how are you sharing this positionality statement, because there could be a way that could undermine your perceived credibility, scientific credibility in other spaces. So yeah, I think there's something to be said for that. I fall on more, there's probably more benefit from doing more to unearth this a little bit more than just pretending it doesn't exist. But I think there's also, it's not this categorical thing that it's all great, there's no downside. So I think that's important to know on two. Um, on one, yeah, similarly, like 
for the purposes of time, I didn't get into sort of varied contributions and other people who are not problematic, but my experience has been um, personally N of one, anecdata, data, talking about this kind of thing with uh, students of color who are underrepresented in quant and stat, they often find this history of knowledge refreshing. Um, my experience has been talking with students, they often feel like stat classes are not welcoming. You hear a lot of ideologies about who's good at math and things in those classes. And when students hear this history spoken, they often feel more connected to the coursework instead of less, has been my experience. Um, and I think there's people who are trying to think about doing quantitative training in different ways that articulate a similar thing. But I think there's a way you can do it. I think there's a way you could present this history and to say, here's this history, therefore you don't belong, I think is a different kind of messaging than here's this history, how can you think about your place within it and what you might contribute given where it's come from? Um, and I think those are different things. I think one of the reasons for me personally, it feels important to speak about that history is like, I didn't really hear about it until I was 45 and I've been doing quantitative methods for a long time. And so I just feel like it should be part of more of the conversation we do have of acknowledging the history we have. But you know, I think reasonably people can uh, think about how do I enact this? How do I say it? How do I message this with people? I think there's some nuance there that's important. Thank you so much for the questions, just for reasons of time, and I know lots of people have to depart. I just want us to be able to say thank you to the speaker that's really brought up some very important issues that I'm sure we'll be talking about for a while. Thank you for the questions. And thank you so much. Thank you.